So hi, um, my name is Narayan. I am a graduate student in sustainability and I am really interested in deep decarbonization. How can we get all of our energy and transportation systems to off of fossil fuels so that way they can use clean energy so we're not uh, warming our planet? And so among the climate conscious, those who study decarbonization, we have developed a new mantra, which is electrify everything. That way we can transition to clean, sustainable sources of energy, like solar and wind power. And so transportation is the biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States of America. And it has been that way in California for many years now. And so transportation is the biggest sector of the economy that we really need to electrify. And so when people think of electric transportation, a lot of people think about um, electric cars like Tesla or Nissan Leafs. And so that's necessary because we need to move these cars beyond gasoline. And so now we're even thinking about electric trucks and buses. Here in California, um, our Air Resources Board is mandating that trucks and buses will have to transition to zero emissions technologies, including electrification. So this is a far-sighted decision and much of the required technology is not really viable yet, but it will become that way thanks to this mandate. And so this is a real step in the right direction. But the problem is that in, in North America, we're largely ignoring another technology that has been viable for decades in other parts of the world. As you just saw in the previous presentation, it's very commonly used in Japan and Taiwan and all sorts of countries across Eurasia, which is of course electric rail technology. Here in this country, a lot of people assume that electric trains means either light rail or subways because that's the only type of electric train that we're exposed to. But they don't realize that it's possible to electrify any type of train up and down the spectrum of what you are trying to do. In Japan and Taiwan and many countries around this world, this is completely normal, but it's a foreign concept in, it's just not commonly used in this country. So it's important to remember that the old school um, electric trains, old school long distance heavy trains can be electric too. And it's not only in the advanced, technologically advanced countries like Taiwan and Japan. In Russia, the entire Trans-Siberian Railway is electrified. And that's thousands of miles across a cold, sparsely populated country. And in South Africa, some of the world's longest, heaviest freight trains are electric, hauling iron ore from the mine to the port. And so in a poor country like India, they are electrifying the entire rail network from top to bottom. So you can see these um, passenger trains, which are using old school passenger cars that are still um, using electricity. And so a new development they've got there is actually moving double stack container trains that are completely electrified. So you can see in this picture, um, they've got, they're hauling double stack container trains without burning a drop of diesel because you've got this really tall pantograph that is connecting the electric wires to the train. And so in this country, we do have one long distance electric rail corridor, which is the Northeast corridor, which goes from Boston to Washington. But um, the, pro and so this is where you find um, high speed rail like the Acela. But the problem is we're not even utilizing the electric infrastructure to its fullest extent. We've still got commuter trains that are burning diesel underneath electric wires. So they're not taking advantage of the infrastructure that we've already got. So in Maryland, um, the Penn line is a commuter rail line that goes on the electrified Northeast corridor. But you can see in this picture, they're still burning diesel and causing pollution. And you see the same situation in the shoreline in Connecticut and the Providence line in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. They're burning diesel underneath electric wires where they don't even need to be. And so, they're, so we're just not taking advantage of the infrastructure that we've already got and let alone moving to the new type of electric infrastructure. Fortunately, there is one ongoing project for heavy rail commuter electrification in America which is Caltrain, which is going from San Francisco to San Jose. So this is the type of project that we need to have more of in this country. Um, it is happening right now and hopefully it'll be done soon. This will transition the currently diesel powered commuter railroad to electric multiple units that travel about 51 miles from San Jose 
to San Francisco. And so we need to have, we're doing this in the Bay Area, but we need to be doing this a lot more all over this country. So one line that is close to home for me, because I'm from San Diego, is the Los Angeles Corridor. This is home to the Pacific Surfliner as well as um, diesel, uh, diesel powered Metrolink and coaster trains. And all of these are currently running on diesel. It extends from Los Angeles to San Diego on the west coast of America. And it also extends further north up to Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo. And so this is the most heavily used Amtrak corridor apart from the Northeast Corridor. And its frequency is going to approach the level of frequency that we see in the Northeast Corridor and Caltrain. And so this is also a really ripe case for electrification. Here in California, we actually do have um, targets to get to net zero emissions by 2045 at the statewide level and 2035 here in San Diego County, where I live, where this train operates. And so in order to achieve that goal, we absolutely must electrify this railroad because we can't afford to keep burning diesel and polluting our atmosphere. When you electrify it, then that enables to help that enables the train to operate at higher frequency and faster, and that enables more people to ride the rails and not their cars. Other rail services that are ripe for electrification on this continent are um, the extensions that connect to the Northeast Corridor in the Northeast, such as Amtrak's Empire Service, which goes from New York to Albany and Buffalo and Niagara Falls. So this is currently burning diesel, but it connects to the Northeast Corridor in um, New York Penn Station. And if we get the right type of investment, then we could make this entire route electric, and that would save a lot of fossil fuels and reduce emissions. Same goes for some of the other extensions that go from Washington into Virginia. Right now, we've got Northeast Regional trains that continue from Washington into Virginia, and they have to transition to diesel traction once they do that. But if we uh, complete electrification of these routes, then they can use electric locomotives and stop burning diesel. Another corridor that's really ripe for electrification is the Via Rail Corridor in Canada, which goes from Windsor to Toronto to Montreal to Quebec, with other routes to Ottawa and Sarnia. And so this is, current, this is the busiest railway line in Canada, but it is still burning diesel. And so it's absolutely possible and necessary to electrify this route, um, but it just has not happened yet. And Canada also does have some pretty aggressive goals to get to net zero emissions, just like many other countries do. And so in order to achieve that, they really need to electrify this route. And so it's important to remember that rail electrification is not only for passengers, it's also for freight. And so a key example of a freight corridor that's right for electrification is the Alameda corridor. This is a railway line that goes from the port of Long Beach and Los Angeles to the railway yards in the middle of Los Angeles. And so this was built in 2002 as an underground trench. So that way the freight trains don't have to be risk collisions with um, passenger cars or pedestrians. And so it was built underneath a, in in a trench for great separation. And you've got these concrete things that go across and above the railway line. And so this was built with electrification in mind. It would be very easy to string electric wires above these concrete things that go over the line. But they just have never done that. And so right now, they've got a project to expand the Alameda corridor to have four tracks. And so I hope that the people in charge of this authority can actually Put electric wires above this at the same time and that way they can reduce pollution in this area because this part of Los Angeles has a huge problem with diesel pollution which really harms the lungs of the people who live there. there. So to give a recap, um, the electric traction has so much benefits compared to diesel traction which is most commonly used in North America. Electric motors are inherently more efficient because energy is not wasted as heat during combustion. And regenerative braking enables the energy that's lost when the train stops to be recovered. Electric trains enable higher speed and frequency of service because they can stop and start more, more rapidly than diesel powered trains can do that. 
And the operating costs are 50% lower than with diesel trains because you don't have to buy fuel. And buying and maintaining the locomotives is also 20 to 35% cheaper than with diesel locomotives. If there's any underground component or tunnel component of your system, then there's a huge benefit because you don't need a ventilation system to deal with the fumes to protect public health. And so, um, the, so that's basically a recap of my presentation. But the good news is right now in America, we do have an opportunity to realize these um, opportunities. Finally, we have a president who actually understands this and cares about this. Um, here's a picture of our new president, Amtrak Joe, in an electric locomotive. Um, so I think right now we do have um, the possibility to electrify our railroads along with the rest of our economy and reduce emissions down to zero.